Literature adds to reality. It does not simply describe it. It enriches the necessary competencies that daily life requires and provides. 
and in this respect it irrigates the deserts that our lives have already become a very warm good morning to one and all present here it's really a great pleasure and honor to take this moment i feel privileged to be a part of this auspicious occasion literature is powerful enough to project those societal realities and vulnerabilities of the voiceless section of human beings seen in the history of the world english literature embarks on well known and untrodden historical instances showcasing the disharmony of indian societies indian literature exhibits the conflict and disharmony of the societal groups generally is destined to investigate insurgency get ready for an unparalleled literary experience at the second edition of the western guards lit fest in coimbatore building on the success of last year this festival is said to be a grand celebration of literature bringing together renowned authors and thinkers from diverse backgrounds over the course of two jam packed days attendees can expect a rich tapestry of events from engaging panels to thought provoking speeches and book launches with a carefully created lineup of speakers and opportunities for aspiring writers to own their craft the western guards lit fest 2.0 promises an intellectually stimulating and creatively inspiring atmosphere it's not just an event it's a transformative experience that celebrates the magic of words and ideas inviting everyone to immerse themselves in the world of literature don't miss this chance to be a part of a literary extravaganza that will leave you inspired and enriched to start up for the events of the day i request chairman professor p kanaga sabhapati to come up to the stage to deliver the chairman's address vanakkam namaskar respected elders dear guests and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome you all to the second edition of the two day literary festival being organized by the veranda club today and tomorrow called the western gods lit fest the veranda club is a cultural initiative involved in direct Uh, diverse activities relating to the bharatiya sanskriti over the last 3 years it has published more than 850 articles relating to our culture tradition contemporary affairs it has conducted more than 200 events both uh, physical and online <clears throat> it organizes book launches author talks and discussions our organization has readers and chapters across the globe in different parts of the uh, different countries after the first edition of the western gods lit fest during last year october 2022 we organized a one day tamil program lit fest called kongu tamil sangamam during the beginning of the tamil new year uh, april 2023 we invited experts from different fields to share their views on tamil civilization which is being under attack you may be knowing now particularly in the recent past you know uh, the the ruling establishment has started attacking the very foundations of our civilization sanatana dharma so we invited people from uh, different fields working uh, in these areas and then we had a wonderful one day program for this two day event we have invited experts from across the country who are doing their best in their chosen fields to preserve protect our civilization and to take it forward so there are going to be uh, 11 book launches special addresses special sessions and cultural events there are people from different walks of life we will be coming we will come to know about them during the course of our uh, sessions <clears throat> this would not have been possible without the full involvement of the veranda club founder my dear young brother jagannathan director <laughs> sarvana kumar with the able guidance of our mentor in chief sri sundar ayer and we are happy to have shrimati safali vaidya as the curator chief curator the theme for this year's 
addition bharat fast fast forward is very important because bharat is not just another country she is a civilization ancient civilization and perhaps the longest living civilization in the whole world our achievements in different diverse fields were extraordinary and pioneering during the course of our uh, um, life but we were subjugated for several centuries but our ancestors have been fighting for our rights and uh, uh, it is unfortunate that even after independence we did not realize our full potential as a result we did not achieve what we could have achieved field study show that we have strong foundations much of our uh, society remains strong even today but what we lacked for a long time was strong leadership and lack of confidence was also there but over the last few years things are improving things are changing bharat in spite of all difficulties has been moving ahead today we are the third largest economy in terms of ppt terms we are the fastest growing economy and we are getting more and more inclusive with uh, many developmental schemes as a result bharat is getting recognized as an important power at the global level our civilizational value systems like vasudeva kutumbakam etc are getting recognized across the world but there is still a long way to go there are critical uh, roadblocks hindering our progress as a nation as a civilization bharat has to move fast forward for this we the english speaking elite educated sections of india need to understand our history better our traditions functioning systems challenges and issues before us in this connection we hope that this festival literary festival fast forward is going to present our nation in an objective and realistic manner so let us listen to the experts learn from them exchange views there are there is going to be enough time to exchange our views and realize ourselves as a civilization as a nation you know after centuries of enslavement and after decades of loss of confidence post 1947 we are moving towards the right direction in a way and are on way to recognize to emerge as a powerful nation bharat is the only civilization all of us know that withstood the onslaughts of the both the abrahamic forces for centuries but still we are fighting with them so there is need for us to understand ourselves better to realize our strengths weaknesses in this connection this bharat fast forward is expected to provide inputs to us valuable inputs to us <clears throat> bharat is the only civilization that reminds us the lighthouse if i can say so uh, in an otherwise dark environment we all know during the last uh, 10 15 years particularly after the global crisis and recently after the uh, uh, corona ukraine russia war and all we remain the only hope because west that remained as the uh, leading force for almost two centuries has lost is losing its significance very fast whether it is economically socially or even culturally so we remain as the only hope for the rest of the world as well so in this connection let us resolve to contribute to our best to make our motherland as the best one in the world thank you very much starting out on our list of wonderful speakers is shrimati shafali vaidya an author speaker fellow in ananta leadership program and an avid social media personality we request you to come up to stage ma'am anevarkum namaskaram it gives me great pleasure 
to come here and to welcome you all to the second edition of the Western Ghats Literature Festival. Um, as a chief curator, it is a greatest joy to see this festival grow leaps and bounds and full credit of this goes to Jagan, to Shravan Kumar, to Professor and to all of you who have supported this festival. Let me start a little bit by how the idea came into being. So I knew about the Veranda Club and I knew about all the wonderful things that they were doing, all the book launches they were doing, all the events they were doing. So in a conversation with Jagan, Shravan and the team, I said, uh, why don't you start a literature festival, full-fledged two days literature festival, where um, a lot of uh, Indic thinkers would come and they would put forth their views and there would be book launches, there would be re literature-related activities. And uh, this happened in August 2022, more or less. So they said, we'll definitely think about it. And I thought that, okay, I had said this, made this suggestion to other places also, uh, typically tier two cities, which didn't have events like this. And they all said, yeah, yeah, it's a very great idea. We should do it. And nobody had really got back to me on that, saying that we will do it. So I was surprised in September, I got a call saying that, Akka, we are doing this and we are doing this in next month. We are doing it on 7th and 8th October. This kind of fast action, I had not seen anywhere. Last year, we had some amazing speakers. We had Kike Mohammed sir, we had uh, Anand Ranganathan, we had Vikram Sampad, we had Dushan Sridhar, talking about a variety of topics. So uh, as a beginning, as a first time edition of a literature festival in Coimbatore, where uh, Coimbatore has had a long tradition of arts and culture and literature, and it was fitting that this city would have such a beautiful homegrown literature festival. This year, the festival has grown even bigger. There are more sessions, there are 11 book launches, there are lots of new authors which are going to be introduced and it is going to get even bigger. In the future, we plan many more things like maybe a literary award, maybe a grant for writers to write a book. Many, many, many more things are being planned. And I'm sure with the amazing teamwork of Jagan and Shavan Kumar with guidance from the professor and uh, the support of everybody in this room, it will happen. But there are things that this festival will never do. One is it will never, never, never host any writer or uh, um, uh, intellectual who is working against India's national interests. <laughs> we are talking at a time, and right now one of the biggest corporate funded lit fests in Mumbai has invited a known Islamic bigot who has gone on record saying that non-Muslims are like animals, they have diseased minds, it's all public knowledge and such individuals are being platformed by one of the largest industrial groups of India, that is our tragedy. We will never become like them. We will stand for Bharat, we will stand for the culture of Bharat, we will stand for the traditions of Bharat and we will follow the Bharatiya tradition of Samvad. And this festival believes that Vade Vade Jayate Tattva Bodha. We will have some of the brightest mind of Bharat come here year after year and uh, have dialogues with the audience. One thing we have always decided uh, to incorporate in this festival is the element of informality. This is not a festival where the speakers will sit on a high stage and the audience will sit in the hall and there is no interaction. This is an informal samvad, informal dialogue between the speakers and the audience. And uh, that, that element of informality, that element of interaction is something that has been carefully thought through. As you've seen, this is a lit fest with a difference. It started off with the lighting of the lamp, started off with Saraswati Puja, it started off with Vedic chanting. And even the programs that are going to be held at the end of the day will celebrate Bharatiya culture. Literature is but one aspect of it. But this literature festival, it's actually about Bharat, about Bharat in all its respects. There is a very nice story in Vishnu Dharmotar Purana, I'll end up with this. There is a king who wants to learn uh, Shilpakala. So he goes to Sage Markandeya and says that I want to learn how to carve, I want to become a Shilpin. So what can I do? 
So Sage Markandeya tells him that it's very nice that you want to learn Pratima Lakshana, that you want to learn how to make the perfect uh, sculpture, but for that you have to learn the art of painting. So the king says, okay. But Sage Markandeya says, no, no, it doesn't end there. To learn the art of painting, you have to learn the Natya Shastra. So the king says, okay, just to become a Shilpi, I have to learn all these things. So Sage Markandeya says, but that is not it. To learn the Natya Shastra, you have to learn Nritya. To learn Nritya, you have to learn Sangeet. To learn Sangeet, you have to learn Geet. You have to learn literature. So all the art that you see in India, all the literature that you see in Bharat, our tradition is that it is all connected. And this festival celebrates that interconnectedness of Bharat's culture. And we are talking about Bharat fast forward. Because I'll end with the quote by Charles Dickens. It is applicable to today's Bharat when he says in his book, uh, The Tale of Two Cities, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, it's the spring of hope, it's the winter of despair. I'm sure all of us have felt, you know, at times this thing. But the truth is, today Bharat is in a place like never before. We are the generation that will see the Ram Mandir being built, the Ram Mandir being consecrated. There has been a never a better time to be a Rashtra Bhakta, to be a nationalist in Bharat. Never forget that. And this festival is a celebration of that feeling of Bharatianess. Once again, I welcome you to the second edition of the Western Ghats Literature Festival. And I seek your support and blessings so that every passing year, this festival becomes bigger and better. Dhanyavada. Thank you, ma'am. Your enthusiasm and positive energy has contributed to a great start for this event. Next up on our list is Dr. Anant Ranganathan Ji, an author, consulting editor, TV panelist, a remarkable researcher and a multiple-time Young Scientist Medal awardee on stage for a rousing book launch. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, such a pleasure to be back uh, in Coimbatore, the land of the original Mysore Park. Uh, I hope there is no one from Karnataka here because, <laughs> as the saying goes, they, they can give Tamil Nadu Kaveri, but they won't give Mysore Park. So. <laughs> but absolutely marvelous. And thank you to the organizers, to curators, and such wonderfully curated by Shefali, my good friend, and Jaggi, and El Professor. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it's such a pleasure. And to actually see this, as Shefali said, to see this grow right before our eyes is uh, a real a tribute to the organizers and to the city as well, you know, to be so receptive towards something, it's, it's wonderful. And thank you for organizing my book launch. It's, it's a real pleasure. I'm absolutely honored and indebted to all of you uh, beyond this hall as well who've received the book with such enthusiasm. To be very honest with you, I did not expect, um, uh, it's almost, I think, uh, till yesterday, 39,000 copies have been sold in uh, one and a half months. Uh, or rather two months since its launch. 
and uh, it's just uh, unbelievable. Uh, this is a country where 5,000 copies sold are considered uh, bestseller. So uh, I don't know what you have done. It really is, is a tribute to you uh, uh, more than anybody else. So forever indebted. Uh, the Marathi edition is coming out very soon. The Hindi edition is coming out, I think, in a week's time so, or two weeks' time. So um, above and beyond that. Um, before the, the, the launch, I thought um, uh, uh, because the title of uh, what I'm supposed to speak on is, uh, is more or less the title of the book. Um, and dare I say, use the cliche, please read my book. But uh, if I were to say that and stop there, uh, then the next 35 minutes would be in uh, absolute silence and we don't want that. Um, and the organizers have said they have kept five minutes for uh, question and answer. Uh, may I uh, veto that and keep half amount, so let's say 20 minutes for question and answers because I want it to be as interactive as possible. Um, all of you have, uh, uh, have always asked such very probing questions and I've learned from there, so I think I, I really love it if I speak for about 10-15 minutes and then we'll we will keep the rest for question and answers. I think that uh, that would be lovely. Uh, I thought uh, rather than uh, elucidate exactly the points uh, that are there in the book, which is Hindus in Hindu Rashtra, um, uh, uh, and those eight points are the problems that exist, that have existed in, um, in India for the last 70, 75 years. Um, they existed and they persist. So existence was because of uh, Congress. Persistence is because of BJP. <laughs> uh, let's be very honest about it. Um, and these are eight reasons why I say we are eighth class citizens. And um, to be very honest with you, I did not know uh, four or five of those even a year ago. Uh, so I was in the same boat as a lot of people uh, not knowing the intricacies or even the names or the phrases of, for example, uh, the Waqf Act, uh, uh, you know, what does Waqf actually mean and um, uh, what is the Places of Worship Act, what is the RTE, why is it anti-Hindu, so many other things. But that's the listing out of the problems. Uh, now, I was talking to uh, an absolute legend yesterday, it was a real, real honor to be sitting with uh, uh, Mr. Vishnu Jain, who's an advocate. He and his father have done more than most Indians to um, uh, keep alive the flame of our civilization. Um, uh, I don't know whether he's there in the, uh, in the audience today, maybe uh, he's not yet. Yes, he's a bit of a late riser, I think. Uh, um, but uh, the astonishing conversation I had with him was eye-opening. And, uh, of course, he's, he's like the book. Uh, he's recommended it. But he also said, uh, you know, what are the solutions? We know the problems. And a lot of people uh, have uh, made me climb the second rung of the ladder, the first rung being identify the problem. The sec second rung is uh, walk a little bit. <laughs> and the third rung is uh, find out the solution. Now, overwhelmingly, 99.99% of the time, the solutions are given by the, po the politicians. Uh, in our country, it is another matter that 99% of the time, the problems are also given by the politicians, but <laughs> solutions never come. But I thought I'll, I'll use the next 10, 15 minutes and then throw it open to the audience to, to think of the solutions for each of these eight reasons. I think that, I would say, sufficiently would possibly go beyond the book. It's all very well to discuss the book, to talk about these eight things. Um, but to, to, for myself, and to seek solutions for that, I think would be, uh, would do justice to the, uh, the essence of this conference itself, which is uh, Bharat, uh, you know, fast, fast forward. Um, so let's go fast forward, uh, in fact, to the eighth reason and then go backwards from there. Because I think um, uh, I want to discuss that first because uh, uh, that was the one that is freshest in my mind um, uh, with my discussion, after my discussion with Vishnu. 
so uh, let let me first talk about just just list out those eight reasons why i feel hindus are eighth class citizens and they are uh, given in the book the first one is state control of hindu temples the second is injustice towards kashmiri hindus the third is the waqf act the fourth is the rte act the fifth is the legislations that appease non hindus but target hindus the sixth is the judiciary that almost exclusively tries to reform only hinduism the seventh is celebrating those who killed and converted millions of hindus and the eighth is places of worship act so let's go backwards and i'll try and give solutions they may not appeal to many of you which is exactly what i want because i want solutions from you so i absolutely welcome disagreement and um, although i always overwhelmingly agree with uh, my good friend shifali i have a slight disagreement when she talked about that islamic jihadi bigot i'll add jihadi to it mehdi hasan who was invited to uh, tata thing i think uh, such people should be invited but they should not be eulogized they should be taken to task so instead of keeping his panel with shashi tharur who basically uh, you know two sides of the same coin depending upon which way shashi wakes up in the morning uh, uh, you know um, uh, team up uh, this mehdi hasan with j sai or vikram you know fellow will never come back even when he is invited next time i think th that should be the thing you know you need to expose these bigots and shifali is absolutely right the kind of contempt he shows for non muslims is in he, it's public so he's not ashamed of it and as i say uh, he is a good muslim you know because he believes in every quranic commandment so he calls jews pigs cattle apes and you know non muslims kafirs and their animals i said and pure contempt now somebody like that is pitted against uh, you know shashi or some rajdeep or things like that i mean that's in the same the same well and you keep on uh, croaking you know but if uh, sai is dropped into that well uh, then these people uh, will never come back so i think that should be the idea to call such people and then to expose them so just a slight disagreement um for example i would love it if the next edition of western ghast lecture you have uh, you uh, you invite akburuddin or asaduddin owaisi <laughs> i think that would be absolutely wonderful uh, forget about coming for the fourth edition they might leave india <laughs> Uh, which would not be a very good thing to be honest with you uh, because we all love ovc don't we um <laughs> no but so so let's move backwards from the eighth reason why we are eighth class citizen the first is places of worship act and i'll be only giving uh, i won't be surmising these now because most of them uh, most of you have, who've read the book especially know about these problems what are the solutions now places of worship act the simple solution is rather than dilly dallying and waiting for the courts this government so called hindutvavadi government with uh, hindu hriday samrats plural at the helm should abrogate it plain and simple and i'll tell you why they should do it because it is barbaric that this act exists not only exists in our country it has been ratified by the highest court of the land in the 2019 ayodhya judgment uh, saying claiming that it purports to um, uphold the values of diversity and secularism in our country these are supreme court's words um, nothing can be further away from the truth it's a barbaric act and to use this act is to deny the the greatest principles of democracy which is that every citizen has a right to seek justice you may disagree with the verdict uh but at least you should have the right to approach the court to get the verdict so how on earth in a democracy that fundamental concept has been denied is just so bizarre and shocking it is beyond um anger so i look at many of these and i actually smile and laugh i said this can't be happening but you know this is happening and for indians to accept it uh not just indians for people whose role it is 
to um, uh, to kind of fight for Hindu rights. Not just these are not Hindu rights; these are Indians' rights. These are citizens' rights. Tomorrow, if you are aggrieved and you want to seek justice, how would you feel if I suddenly say, "I'm sorry, you can't approach court"? This is exactly what Place of Worship Act does. And yesterday, and I'll just tell you the conversation I had with Vishnu, and he's, he's of course fighting more than 100 cases, he and his father. Um, and he's a minority, by the way, fighting for Hindu rights. I mean, Jan, but uh, he doesn't, he's in the Hindu fold. He's an amazing personality. Um, and he was talking about the Kashi uh, case that he's fighting, uh, where millions of dirty feet have been washed at what the faith of Hindus says was their holiest of places. Uh, that is to be expected because that has been ordained. Those are the reasons why thousands of temples were demolished. Those are the reasons why the demolished temples sometimes were deliberately kept half demolished and uh, other places of worship made, constructed on top of them to celebrate the humiliation so that it is visible. You know, you don't want to humiliate someone uh, uh, in secret. You want it to be known to the world that, yes, I have subjugated you. And that is the reason why Gyan Vyapi Mosque exists over the temple. That's not been completely demolished. Place of Worship Act, the only exception being Ram Janam Bhumi, it prohibits changing the scenario of any place of worship after 1947. So, for example, the the grave, cruel historical injustices of Kashi, Mathura, and a thousand others. According to Sri Sita Ram Goel, who's written two authoritative volumes on this, Hindu temples and what happened to them, um, he gave evidence of 1,800 temples that were demolished and mosques built on them. Um, according to Jay Sai and um, Vikram Sampath, the number could be as high as 40,000. And I was the first one who... Um, uh, at least publicly, uh, hours after uh, Dr. Mohan Bhagwat said that there's no need to look for shivling in every mosque uh, or whichever the case may be. We just want three. I said, no, even if there are 40,000 mosques and we need to look for each and every shivling there. Um, it is not a Hindu saying this. It is not a Darwinian atheist saying this. It's an Indian saying this. Um, the question is, what can be done about it? I have identified the problem. And just to add to that, Vishnu is fighting for the Kashi case. What was interesting was he told me about the Mathura case, which is, is so cruel because the cruelty has also been added from the Hindu side as well. And when he talked about uh, how uh, the land, uh, the Mathura, Krishna, Krishna Janam Bhumi land, 13-odd uh, acres of it, was controlled by uh, a Hindu king after it was under the control of Marathas for some period of time. Uh, there was a Krishna Janamsthan trust made Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya under the ages of Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya and uh, they got the control of that land. And all was fine until 1944, 1946 when uh, Pandit Madan Mohan passed away. And after that, a Farsi trust was made by some politicians and their cohorts. And they kind of came to an agreement with the Muslims who had started to encroach on that land that let's maintain the status quo. Wherever the, till the point where Muslims have come, encroached, that would be theirs and we should be allowed with ours. This happened in 1960, 1968. Uh, and this was Krishna Janambhumi uh, Seva trust, some other trust, not the real trust. And the courts agreed. And now there is a masjid there. And Vishnu was telling yesterday, he and his father went to some Dur Daras, Pulis Thanas and Mathuras and all those archaeological ASI sites and everything, dug out the original documents of who actually possesses that land. So it was not a case to be even contested by the, the second Krishna Janam Bhumi Seva that went into an agreement with the Muslims, it was not their case at all. What are we talking about? What kind of injustices have been meted to us? 
this is fraud and the supreme court is saying yes it may be fraud but you cannot approach us now in which democracy i ask you <laughs> can this be allowed maybe in syria and lebanon and palestine but it is being allowed in india so this act has to be abrogated plain and simple bjp is kowtowing and it is uh, hiding behind the thin veil of uh, its matter is in courts and courts are no that's rubbish you abrogate it you you've done things you've you've overturned a supreme court judgment modi has done only once congress did so many times but the uh, draconian pro provisions of the scst act supreme court said these are draconian uh, you know we won't allow this and uh, the government modi government overturned the supreme court judgment and those draconian uh, acts or clauses of the scst act were made valid it's another matter that all the opposition that says uh, that modi government has taken over the institution of supreme court and is going against supreme court, they all were with sided with narendra modi in overturning the supreme court judgment because everyone is out there to placate their vote banks then they did not feel that modi is overturning a supreme court judgment because they also wanted the judgment to be overturned but here why is narendra modi and the bjp or the government waiting for the supreme court to supreme court has already adjudicated it has ratified the place of worship act in the 2019 ayodhya judgment glowingly so supreme court is not going to abrogate it so the solution is this act has to go and has to go by the government and, and if somebody has a problem like people had a problem with abrogation or annulment of article 370 they are free to approach the courts let them approach the court let so go the other way don't wait for the courts to tell you after years that uh, this act should stand as it is and then you dilly dally for another few years and then uh, uh, you know whatever happens no why are you waiting so that's the first done and dusted the the seventh one going backwards there was celebrating those who killed and converted millions of hindus now this is tricky because you have bjp education minister saying we are proud to have not removed even a single full stop and a comma from our textbooks <laughs> so how do you how do you act under such circumstances uh it's very difficult to begin with because uh one may let's be very honest there is there is no doubt a limited renaissance that has happened in this country a lot of people um logical rational right minded individuals have found voices or let's put put it this way the nation has discovered their voices uh you know so uh, whereas 20 years ago shri sitaram goel and so many others majumdar and so many other wonderful people uh who had so many important things to say went unheard in today's day and age such people don't get uh are not left unheard so that's the good thing but unless you change the textbooks unless you reform what children are reading in the formative years take it from me i belong to the i am a child of the 70s and the 80s it takes decades for me to unlearn and not just decades i mean one or two decades in my case four decades i'll give you an example all my life i thought ashoka saw the devastation of the kalinga war and he was so devastated that he converted to buddhism 3 years ago i was reading sanjeev sanya's book and i learned that ashoka was already a buddhist for 4 to 8 years before he conducted the kalinga war so all that devastation that he perpetrated all those tens of thousands that he killed he killed as a buddhist not as a hindu i learned it after 40 years not just a decade or two and by those 40 years my thought processes have already been aligned to a particular ide ideology or to a particular sect a particular religion a particular way of doing things a particular way of learning things that's the tragedy of not changing your school textbooks this is absolutely wonderful but this should be the secondary stage the primary stage is always where you tell the truth about this country about its so called heroes who are actually tyrants 
there is a, a shrine for Aurangzeb. It's just unbelievable. That man perpetrated a genocide against Hindus that killed 4.6 million people. He demolished hundreds of temples. All those historical records are there. The historical record, his farmans to demolish Kashi Vishwanath, to demolish the, uh, uh, the temple in Mathura, to take the idols, to break those idols, to take the broken idols to Agra, and to put them on the steps of the Begum Masjid there, so that people going inside would trod on them. All these are historical records. And we have politicians going there and worshipping this man. Is there a grave for Hitler in, uh, in Germany? Even the graves of Hitler's parents have been removed, the tombstones. So that even by mistake, people don't go there and start, you know, praying or worshipping their son. That is the extent to which Germany has gone. And here we are worshipping. There is Babar Road. There was Aurangzeb Road. There was Aurangzeb Lane till about uh, uh, two months ago. You know, These are things that we have learnt because we've been forced to remain ignorant. This has to change. The solution is clear. You have to tell the truth about these people. You don't have to, uh, you know, make TV serials that eulogize Tipu Sultan. He swore off Tipu Sultan as kids. We, we worship Tipu Sultan. It's only four or five years ago that I started reading the manifesto of Tipu Sultan in his own language, in his own words. Then I realized that next to Aurangzeb, the biggest tyrant is possibly uh, Tipu Sultan. If I say the same thing in Karnataka, there would possibly be FIR against me. But that's the fact. Karnataka police has arrested journalists who've criticized Tipu Sultan. This is the extent to our brainwashing. When the man himself in his words is saying, annihilation of the kafir is the holy duty of every Muslim. These are Tipu's words. When he destroyed, according to some reports, 800 temples, churches, Converted thousands, lakhs, converted even dead Kurgis. He is the man who is eulogized. Forget Aurangzeb, look at uh, Tipu. So many others that I have, uh, I don't have time to go into each and every of those calamitous barbarians who we still eulogize, who our prime minister still, and I, I cannot say unknowingly because he's the prime minister, he has to know the facts about St. Francis Xavier. Shefali has written authoritatively on what a barbarian he was. He was, even if the Goa Inquisition was not conducted under his ages, he was the architect of it. He was the thrust behind it. You know? And the kind of statements that he made against uh, Hindus, the conversions that he desired, and we have our Prime Minister paying glowing tributes to him. You read about Chishti, our Prime Minister uh, putting a chadar on him, you read about what he said about Hindus, the primary duty of the Muslims. So this is not something that we can blame primary school kids. You have to blame the Prime Minister. Why are we shirking away from it? So the solution to this is somebody has to go to the very top and say enough is enough. That person was Minakshi Jain, but she had to resign or she left that committee because she was so disgusted and appalled by what was happening. People aren't just, aren't just prepared to listen. You know? The truth about communism, why is it not known? For example, in JNU, why are people roaming around wearing Che Guevara t-shirts? Do they not know that he was a homophobic mass murderer? The fact is they don't know. That is why they eulogize. If they did know the reality of communism, if they did know the reality of Mao, of Pol Pot, of the CPIM, of the fact that Ashutanandan was demoted because he held blood donation camps during 1962 war for our Javans. His party castigated him, demoted him. How dare you open blood? These are facts that need to be known. If you don't know them, you cannot act further. So that's the, the seventh issue. Uh, the sixth is judiciary that almost exclusively tries to reform Hinduism. Now, what can I say about this? I already have a contempt case against me, but 
so he is fighting it so it's up to him it's not up to me i can say whatever i want <laughs> leave it on sai ja ko rakhe sai it's a travesty it's a joke that you have judiciary deciding upon the height of the handi judiciary deciding upon each and every ritual of hinduism deciding whether what is right what is wrong but then covering away as i say like a wet cat under a lamp post when it comes to rituals of other religious denominations so they will say animal sacrifice is cruel in kullu dashera we ban it in tripura we ban it but they will not ban halal the practice of halal which many european countries have prohibited and said the animal has to be stunned before halal can be carried out it is one of the most cruel rituals according to them and if you look at the way it is performed performed only by a muslim has to chant bismillah rahman rahim the head of the animal has to be aligned to the kaaba and you have to perform it's a ritual but you will not ban it you will try and ban as it was jelly kattu for a long time animal cruelty you will try and ban hindus taking their priest in a palaki as a procession that's the tradition saying that this is forced labor these are words forced labor but you will not ban uh, muharram where you self flagellate sometimes to even take your own life that apparently is not human cruelty that you almost kill yourself and others by thrashing yourself with steel claws and whips uh that's not cruelty but we know this is the country where we live where people are uh, are scared but for the judiciary to be scared even that i accept what i do not accept is the hypocrisy of it admit you are scared like i admit i am scared i mean i am not kamlesh tiwari you know i am scared somebody will come all of us are because the state doesn't back us we know what happened in the case of nupur the state you know far from backing her actually threw her under the bus so it's the opposite that has happened and till today not a single fact checker i have prodded and prompted them told me what was it wrong that nupur said if what she said and she said is quoted in hadiths then aunt hadiths hate speech why are you going after nupur but no fact checker came up with that but around the same time there was an uh, ias officer uh, a upsc uh, coach uh, tutor he said something egregious uh, uh, in in uh, ramayana he said it is there in ramayana and there was a huge hue and cry and there were fir's against him the very next day those same media houses and fact checkers brought him live on camera with mahabharata with books and he said look this is i have quoted verbatim so am i perpetrating hate or are these books and then the controversy died down why could the similar thing be have been done with nupur they didn't have the guts to do it judiciary didn't call for it judiciary should have said rather than castigating nupur and saying you killed kanaiya lal you have put the country on fire you have ignited the country you have a loose tongue rather than saying all that the judiciary should have said that what you say is that quoted or is that not but they didn't so what is the solution there i mean i in this case i am a bit tied because i i can i sack all those judges <laughs> i don't know if i can do that but judicial reforms are the crux but that's again a bit indirect because you may reform the judiciary but can you reform the judge that's up to the judge so there i'm afraid the solution is is not quite there uh, i have 5 5 10 minutes i think before i throw open the this thing uh, 30 seconds plus added to that yes um uh, then there are legislations that appease non hindus but target hindus now this we know i don't need to go into that there are so many acts the hindu code bill for example that tried to end reformed hinduism likewise there is no muslim code bill or christian code bill people in fact are scared to even discuss it there the solution rather than my 
listing out the problems. The solution is bring in the uniform civil code. Just bring it. The government asked public opinion for it, but I think the whole thing has died down. I don't think uh, Mr. Modi will bring it before 2024. Uh, he's worried he might not get the 25 votes that uh, he expects from 200 million people. Um, so maybe, maybe he won't do it. But the repercussions of not doing it are not just morally reprehensible, they are repugnant. Because not having the UCC is allowing the same Supreme Court judge who, is, who was then a High Court judge, allowing a 50-year-old Muslim male to marry a 12-year-old Muslim female. Demolishing the Prohibition of Child Marriage Act, which should be as sacrosanct as our Constitution. What else is justice there for? What else is morality and ethics there for? Is it to declare that as soon as a, a woman or a girl attains puberty, which may happen at uh, year nine, she is of marriageable age? It's cruel. It's cruel for her, her physical body. It's cruel for her mental well-being. It's just plain and simple, reprehensible, but it's going on. There is no public hue and cry about it. Very recently, the parliament uh, annulled the clause that allowed for divorce to be given if it turned out that your spouse had leprosy. Believe it or not, a completely curable disease mycobacterium leprae that causes it. If it turned out that you were married to someone who had leprosy, that was enough grounds for divorce. Modi government annulled it. One party and one man opposed it tooth and nail, stood up in the parliament and said, no, this, is, this goes against our religion and our law. That man was Asaduddin Ovesi. No one knows about this. Are they concerned about human beings? No, they are concerned about what has been directed, what human beings should do. They are concerned about the book, not the people. But our scare allows them to listen to them, not to anybody else. Then I come to the RTE Act. Now RTE on its own is not an issue. It's a worthy cause, right to education. The problem is the 93rd Amendment, and coupled with that, and I've explained the intricacies in the book, Article 26 and Art Article 28 and Article 30, which the amendment was passed by with the support of the BJP. Essentially what it does is it allows the uh, minority-run schools to not reserve 25% seats for the EWS or economically weaker sections but it does not grant that same leeway to Hindu-run schools. And what is happening as a result of that is that tens of thousands of schools, Hindu-run schools, are being shut down. Now that is hitting Hinduism at its very core, because what happens is when a Hindu school shut down, shuts down, the parents of that child send it to the next school. Yeah, just, uh, just, just finishing. So you are dismantling bit by bit the Hindu ecosystem itself. So the solution is that amendment has to include or exclude this clause that allowed minority institutions to escape reserving seats for EVS and asked only Hindus to do it. That's the solution for it. Then we have the Waqf Act. What is the solution for that? <laughs> is to absolutely abrogate it. Please read in detail, I have given the sections. I didn't want my opinion on this, so I have given just facts as that, uh, in that section, in that chapter. It is the most draconian of acts. It just has to be abrogated plain and simple. Then you have injustice towards Kashmiri Hindus. Uh, I'm just finishing it uh, very quickly. Uh, the solution is that each and every one of those displaced has to be rehabilitated back to Kashmir. That has to happen. 
that should have happened on day one when Mr. Modi took power, at least that resolve, that each one of those seven lakh displaced Kashmiri Hindus will have to go back to their land, because that is their land. And the first one, of course, state control of Hindu temples, that has to go, absolutely. It is criminal. And what uh, Vishnu Jain was telling me, the differences of how Hindu temples are treated and how masjids and churches and waqf and all those SGPC, they are treated, is just an abomination. It's just cruelty, discrimination on a grand scale. Um, that has to go. So these are the eight solutions that I have given. Uh, how many uh, minutes do we have for question answers? Uh, I'm so sorry. I've Two to three questions, if anybody of you would like to. Yeah, sure. Hey, Anand, uh, welcome to Coimbatore. And uh, you. you know that I know you as a scientist more than anything else. Right. So two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, the question is that um, you, read, you published a paper which I have read. So I want to know whether that's been read by more than your book, which is 39,000, uh -huh. number one. Number two is uh, making a QSAR of how you do. Let's say at 2.30 in the morning, there's a knock in your door in the early hours. So whom would you be expecting? Uh, a person who is going to vandalize because you have quoted extensively the hadith? Or is it because it is the Supreme Court and the others who have ordered that you have trespassed their territory and you are on the border of being contempt? So I wanted to ask you a serious question with a fun note on it. <laughs> right, thank you. Uh, no, I'm, uh, I'm actually quite happy that the science that I do and the papers that I have published are not read by a lot of people. <laughs> uh, I know I'm, uh, that's on a lighter note, but uh, I think that's the way it is. I have written articles on science that have been read uh, and commented by five people. And when I've inserted Modi in it, it has been read by 200 people. And when I've inserted Modi and Rahul Gandhi and Kejriwal in it, it has gone viral. <laughs> so that's, in fact, if I can let, let you in a secret, we scientists are also very cunning people. We know which way the wind is blowing in terms of which way uh, you would get grant for whatever you want to do. Um, so the in thing being space science, uh, so a lot of, even if you're doing biology, just add a few space science and, you know, this geo and all that stuff, uh, you will have a greater chance, I suppose, of putting your hand on the kitty. So, no, but I, I think that's, that's the way it is. I, I, I like it. And that's, that is the way the world over, you know. Um, that's the way it is. Science usually gets its, its somehow. It didn't for the last three years, and I, I can say without being diabolical about it, I think it was important that the nation learned so much about a virus and virology and vaccines because of COVID. Um, I hope it doesn't forget, like we, the nation forgot after SARS-1. Had we a vaccine after SARS-1, we could have used that vaccine in the initial one year when we didn't have a vaccine against SARS-2. That's the lesson that is to be drawn. Uh, so um, that's point number one. The point number two was midnight, two, and, uh, uh, two in the morning. Um, possibly Yogi Adityanath. <laughs> I'm just trying to think, is there anything illegal that I might have built? You know, maybe a water tank outside the home. There's a <laughs> no, but um, uh, I don't think, other than a stray cat, I don't think anybody, uh, people are welcome to come. That's, that's not an issue at all. Yeah, thank you. Yes, there is a committee. There is a committee that is looking into that. After nine years, yes, after uh, you can say uh, uh, you know nine years of uh, more than millions of students having read the same rubbish that we read, something is being the change is supposed to be has been promised on the anvil. Let's see how what happens. Yeah, sure. Fine. sure. There is very rarely that I disagree with you, but on this one thing, you say that nine years nothing has happened in general. 
Now my question to you is what would have happened according to you that Modi should have in his first term only acted on all eight things, then lost the elections, then Congress come back to power and then reversed everything and pulled the country ten years back? Right. So if we, that's a very interesting and important question. Uh, and that in many ways rationalizes inaction, which is what Narsimha Rao also said, that sometimes the best decision to take is not to take any decision. And politicians do rationalize their inactions with that. Uh, there's a lot of scare involved with that, and I think it's true to an extent, because while I believe that Modi and BJP is not pro-Hindu, uh, certainly the actions don't really uh, you know, point towards that, the Congress is anti-Hindu. So that choice people also have realized. People are prepared to wait. People are prepared to... And there's been tremendous amount that has happened on non-Hindu issues, development issues. So that's the reason why Modi is being elected. But on many of these issues, Shifali, I don't think you required nine years. For example, abrogating Place of Worship Act. I mean, uh, why, why, would you why would you worry about Modi not being re-elected because he's abrogated a draconian act, you know? Why, why, why would you worry about Modi not being elected because he has stopped the dissolution of tens of thousands of Hindu schools because of RTE? You know? So many of these, yes, you can say uh, the problematic issues of this would be rehabilitating 7 lakh Kashmiri Hindus because that's a technical difficulty as well and there are issues there. That could take time. Um, legislation, judiciary reforms, yes, you know, that's... Uh, it's, I mean, that's more of always elucidating the problem than giving the solution, because what is the solution there? As I said, you have judicial reforms, but there the opposition will come from the judiciary collegium. We have already seen what happened. So, you know, there, there, that's a tussle that would take years to solve. But half of these shouldn't take any time at all and should not lose uh, votes for Narendra Modi, because they are primarily catering to his constituency. That's, that's the thing. I do agree with you. The top item in your agenda, number one, state yeah, control of temples. Hindu temples yes. And that relates only to Hindus. You're not yes. taking away anything from anybody. Correct. And it should have happened. I completely agree with you. But I also think, and this is my point of view, I think that uh, this government chose its priorities. So that is why it focused in the first five years totally on the last mile delivery and that is why they got elected. So governance is always a, 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 a matter of priorities. But I do agree with you broadly, especially with regard to the state control of temples because I've seen, particularly in this state where we are in, yeah. thousand year old temples and they don't have money to light the lamp every yeah. day yeah. because the government doesn't give it. Yeah. No, absolutely. And you've, you've hit the nail on the head because I've I've said this publicly that this book is at least 15, 20 years ahead of its time. And the reason for that is that this hall might feel that these are the issues that should be prioritized. But there is India outside this hall, and that's 99% of India. They don't even know what these issues are. Half the people in this hall did not know. I did not know half of these issues. So they are saying we don't have a toilet, we don't have a gas cylinder, we don't have a health insurance. We don't have tap water. And you're asking our view whether Hindu temple should come out of government control, whether RTE should... Say, who the hell are you? First, give me all these amenities. That's the issue. So th these are issues that affect us after we are certain of our square meal, after we are well fed, our, after our stomachs are full. You know, these are not issues that affect India. And Modi knows this and credit to him, and I say this not derisively at all. I am proud, in fact, that his government is a toilet gas cylinder sarkar. He has provided 120 million toilets. And scientific investigations have shown that every toilet that has been provided has led to saving of 52,000 rupees for that family. 52,000. Because, and that was the time without Ayushman Bharat and 26 crore Ayushman Bharat cards have been given. 170 million cylinders have been given. The biggest child mortality instance. Do you know what caused it? Not uh, pollution or uh, household pollution. Gas cylinders giving uh, Ujwala has saved 
19 percent lives he has made a huge difference i am not even going to highways and all those things i am talking of basic amenities so in his mind he was absolutely clear in 2009 he said it i want to make a nano class people didn't even know what nano class is they asked what is nano class he said the lowest rung socio economic above that people just think there is the lowest rung and then there is middle class no i want to make he has constructed that nano class almost out of thin air there are people now more than 250 million people who have these basic amenities 416 million people in the last 15 years have been pulled out of extreme multi dimensional poverty that's fantastic but does that mean that we don't even discuss these issues because the impact of these issues go beyond the immediate deliverance of gas cylinders tap water and everything now you are stopping temples being given lakhs of crores of money that is due to them essentially you are stopping construction of tens of thousands of hindu temples making hospitals hindu schools go uh, patshalas goshalas orphanages that muslim places of worship and christian places of worship are doing and converting because they have those schools and hospitals people bringing people into their fold that hindus are simply not able to do so these are not issues that can be pushed aside i agree that these are not issues that can be brought to the table immediately that is what modi is thinking is but everything should happen in parallel you know that's that's the answer limited answer i believe the large responsibility also lies with every hindu how many hindu does go to temple today so if you see the other other religion every friday they religiously go every sunday they religiously go so as a prime minister i believe whatever he has done and unable to do in 9 years he cannot be so vocal he can go to temple and he's he's fully into basma but he will not tell that you guys go to temple so that has to be something that has come from each and every individual and i believe we as a group can educate our hindus to create that kind of awareness now i think change is happening after a few years all hindus every friday they will go to a mosque that's not a question yeah sure. no get them to be aware of what is happening to this civilization of course i am also talking of the big number of children who go abroad who uh, who actually do not know that and they think it is uh, secularism is a big thing and our kind of secularism is just apne pair pe kuladi marna kind of a thing and uh, they are not aware that uh, these practices do have a meaning behind it i myself was not aware till a decade ago the, how important it was so you in your position i would humbly request you to reach out to this kind of educated and uh, upcoming uh, uh, next generation uh, people to be more aware of our civilization and uh, uh, how others also could go about it and let them know the minute we talk about hindu they say you are very right you are uh, talking religion only religion yes they do not uh, understand that there is much behind it and uh, i think being uh, such a public figure and such a loud figure you should also add it for the next generation i think that is a vast majority and uh, especially now with sb403 and all coming in us it seems to be acquiring a dangerous uh, kind of a dimension so that's my worry and i would we humbly request you to address it in any which way that you can and your friends can no thank you very much but i have to say this uh, uh, despite your kindness showered on me uh, the real heroes and legends are people like jesai and vishnu and his father they are the people who are actually making the difference on the ground uh, my position when you say is as exalted as uh, any other professor at jnu to be honest you know um, other than that and i have a lot of other things to do so i i if i am to paraphrase newton if i am able to look further and talk about these issues it is because i am standing on the shoulders of giants like uh, vishnu who yesterday 
in fact, opened my eyes and said, this government is spending more than 3,200 crores giving money to waqf land and buildings on them to give them interest-free loans. How on earth is this secularism? Am I being an Islamophobe if I say this? Do people even understand the definition of secularism? So ma'am, you're right, but at the end of the day, these things have to stem from the top. You know, even Jesai and Vishnu and Vikram, they can only do so much. It has to come from the Prime Minister or the President, you know. Then things change, otherwise, uh, you know, we can uh, talk about it. <laughs> and, uh, listen to you more. That was okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. I request a Shri Krishnan of uh, Shri Krishna Sweets and Shri Shyam Sundarji to come up to the stage to release the book. This is a real honor for me. It's almost like the uh, yes, the God from the Sanctum Sanctorum <laughs> has come to, you know, it's really. I am no longer an atheist. <laughs> I have seen God. I request our Professor uh, Kanaga Sabapati sir to give a memento to Anand sir. How do you turn it on? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. I have a request to the audience and to the speakers that uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, designed this session so that every speaker gets a chance to speak. So uh, please stick to the time limit that's given to you. And a request to the audience, I know all of you have many questions and many observations to make. When you're asking questions here, please phrase it as a question only so that the speaker can respond to you. The speakers are available pre-event and post-event for you to interact with them freely. And whatever doubts, whatever observations you have, you can always share it with them. But here when you're asking questions, just ask the questions, please, so that the speaker gets a chance to interact with you. Thank you. The books will be available for purchase at the Subu bookstall. The author will be present there to sign the book for 10 minutes. Next up, we have Mr. Venkatesh Ranganji, who is a researcher and a senior finance professional with a deep and passionate interest in Indian history, leading him to write books on historic nonfiction. Can we please have you on stage, sir? trying to look for a mic, then I realize it's here. So, so uh, what I'll do is, I'll start with a very chinna history quiz. Don't get worried. It's just right or wrong. Okay, and very simple. First statement. Bharat has always been attacked by invaders. But we never attacked invading countries. So we are such a great country. You know, we are saying, no, I think people have read my book actually. So I think it's, so, 
without further ado, definitely wrong. And why is it wrong? Okay, now, how many of you have heard of Pratihara Nagabhat? Okay, one person. How many have heard of Pratihara Ramabhadra? No people. How many have heard of Parmara Lakshmadeva? Okay, one more person. Bappa Raval? Oh, okay, cool. So, looks like people are reading some chapters from my book. <laughs> anyway, uh, to keep that aside, Pratihara Nagabhat, as per three contemporary inscriptions and manuscripts, two Arabic and one Sanskrit, launched military naval assaults on multiple ports of the Abbasid Caliphate. Zulfar, Dibba, which is in modern day UAE, Basra, which is in Iraq, and Farz, which is in Iran. Okay? His son, Ramabhadra, led this naval operation. Parmara Lakshmadev took a counter-offensive against Ghazni. He went and threatened a place called Termez, which is in Uzbekistan. Okay? And there is a Sanskrit inscription in the Central Nagpur Museum, which very in detail talks about this expedition. Bappa Rawal took a counter-offensive again against the Abbasid Caliphate. Okay? Now, all these names are invisible from our history books. Forget textbooks. I don't think for the fog of knowledge anybody knows about Parmar Lakshmadev. Right? So I think this is beyond left, right, center. Okay? There is a certain invisibility which is there. Let's go to the second quiz question, which hopefully people please uh, maybe forget my book, etc. But keeping aside the 20th century, Bharat and China have always been sister civilizations. We had always peaceful relations. There's a very famous WhatsApp forward which comes, you know, that India conquered China without sending a soldier. So all our sages went there. So how many people think this is right? Or is it right or wrong? No, I think I'm getting into pattern is coming very clear. Okay. So I'll again, uh, so not just firstly when I say China, uh, Firstly, when I say China, it is not the modern day China. So the great, I would say, dichotomy of history is modern day China is far larger than historic China. Right? Because places like Yunnan, Tibet, Xinjiang, etc. were never historically part of China. But I am talking about mainland China, Han China, the eastern central parts of China. We have Chinese texts from at least four different Chinese empires which says that there was military and administrative rule of Indian dynasties over China. One more invisible name, Gahadawal Govind Chandra, right? I don't think anybody would have heard of him. Gahadawal Govind Chandra of Kannauj connected to Tamil Nadu. His sister's inscription is found in Tanjavur. But this Gahadawal Govind Chandra explicitly in a Prakrit text plants his flag in mainland China against the Song Emperor, right? So we'll come to that. Okay. Now, a lot of people got very afraid when I, you know, when I started telling them, see, I've got a book. The book is called Bharat's Military Conquest in Foreign Countries. So first they said, is it about Sri Lanka, Afghanistan? I said, no, 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 I all consider them part of Bharat. They said, no, 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 is it about Southeast Asia? I said, see, it's much beyond and all. Then they got very afraid. They said, see, if you write such a book, then it will destroy our narrative that we are such an ahimsa-loving, peaceful country. You know, our sages went and, you know, without anything, they spread their word. See, our culture is great. Civilization is great. But please try and understand, your enemy doesn't care a damn about your moral standing. He doesn't care a damn about how ahimsavadi you are. Right? He wants to destroy you. He has an existential issue with you. So irrespective of how you suppress your Shatra Dharma, he will come for you. And in fact, if you tell him that, you know, in historically I have never attacked any other invading country, he will attack you more. Because he will know that you are a weak people. You know, you cannot accept your Shatra Dharma itself. Somebody said that as Hindus we should go to temple every day. Go to temple every day. Also realize all those people who sacrifice their life so that his temples are standing. So our Shatra Dharma is very important. Let's not forget that. Peace is very important. Peace backed by strength is what is effective. Okay. Then something... Uh, our merchants and sages went to foreign lands and uh, our merchants, it was very peaceful, you know, we, we traded with Mesopotamia, you know, our Sindhu Saraswati seals have been found in Iraq, you know, we went to Southeast Asia, we built Angkor Wat, etc. All this happened extremely peacefully. 
I think this pattern is becoming very, very, very open, right? So uh, we had a lot of trade, but our traders were protected by the Shatra Dharma of our Chakravartis. Between 633 and 639 CE, the Rashidun Caliphate, the first caliphate of Islamic history, attacked Arde Hind, which was an Indian merchant settlement in Al Faw Peninsula, Iraq. They were defended, that settlement was defended, and the Arabs were pushed back 80 kilometers by Chalukya Pulakeshin. Okay? This is there in no less than four Arabic records, including two communications between the caliph and his generals. Now, very easy. We are in Tamil Nadu only. After the Sangam Age, okay, and I'm not talking about the Sangam Age, all the great emperors. After the Sangam Age, which Tamil emperor establishes authority over Southeast Asia? Very simple question. Okay, anybody else? Okay, anybody else? Wrong question. All of them. So it's not just one emperor. In fact, if you look at it explicitly in the inscriptions and also in Southeast Asian texts, we have at least five emperors. Three Chola emperors, one Pallava emperor, one Pandyan emperor. Okay? Rajendra Chola, Veera Rajendra Chola, Kulatunga Chola, Nandi Varman, Avani Narayanan, and Jatavarman Veera Pandya. And these are people who have explicitly mentioned locations in Southeast Asia. There are many others who have said we have crossed the seas and we have done everything. So importantly, the entire spread of culture, civilization, our architecture, etc. was backed by strong geopolitical hard power. Okay, let's... Let's not disguise that fact. Okay? Okay, one question people ask, if we are so brave, etc., why, why were we invaded so often? See, in history, I just put a cross for the continuity, but in history, we need to learn our lessons both from the good periods and the bad periods. So in our history, those Chakravartis, those emperors, who correctly interpreted the real politics of the Mahabharata, the Artha Shastra, the Nitisara, etc., who clear, clearly interpreted what was Raja Dharma and what was the Ram Rajam, they became victorious and they became successful. Those kings who got into a hubris, those kings who got into a huge ego and thought that they were having grand moral standing, those kings lost. So only if we learn both from our victories and our defeats do we exactly learn what to, to, do, to do now, basically. If we only study that we were, defe we were defeated, we were kind of, you know, then we'll only be demoralized. If we only study that we are victorious, we'll never learn the genocide and the destruction of our temples. We need to learn both sides of the coin in order to chart our future path. Okay? So basically, my book talks about no less than 21 military expedition conquests all across the world by 14 Indian dynasties. Okay? And by 14, I have, I have taken dynasties from all across. So there's no exceptionalism. It is not that only from one region they went to a particular region. Across the board, there are right from the Mediterranean Sea to the Pacific Ocean, there were different kings who uh, conquered or led expeditions to these places. Right? Now, why do I say this? Am I saying this on the basis of what, WhatsApp forward, social media? No. There are 70 inscriptions, texts, archaeological artifacts in 16 languages. Okay? Uh, I personally, and that too I would say I am, I did a very limited research, but I personally refer to 8 Arabic texts, 2 Pahlavi texts, 5 Chinese texts, 5 Tibetan texts, 1 Tocharian text, Malayan, Javanese, and obviously in, in Bharatiya text, there are 25 Sanskrit manuscripts, there are about 5 Tamil manuscripts, multiple Tamil inscriptions, there are Marathi records, and outside there are, uh, there are European texts from different periods. So effectively there are 70 inscriptions, archaeological sites, manuscripts, etc. which talk about this. So we don't have any dirt of information. It is sheer laziness and sheer amnesia on our part that we are not studying this. Okay? So what I'll do is there are 21 expeditions, right? I will only cover six because we have also a limitation of time. And we'll try and understand why these expeditions or conquests were launched uh, basically abroad. Right? A big issue we face right now is rising Hindu phobia. Somebody was talking about acts in the US, right? We do, we do have reports about desecration of, let's say, Hindu temples in somewhere in Brisbane, about Hindu communities attacked in Canada, in UK. We have a pitiful institutionalized repression of Hindu minorities in countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, and forget Hindus, any non-Abrahamic community, the Yazidi community, which faced brutality at the hands of the ISIS, right? 
So today in this geopolitical context, just pause a moment and think about this one expedition which happened about 3000 odd years ago. Now there is one Arabic, uh, a Perso Arabic scholar called Muhammad Ibn Jarir al Tabari. Okay? He lived only about 1200 years ago, around the 9th century, in Baghdad. Now that person wrote a book called Tariq al Rasul wa Muluk. Okay? That's book uh, generally a history of prophets and kings. In the volume 2 of that book, he tried to understand what was the history of the Middle East before Christianity. So he went and met several tribes in the Mediterranean region. He went and he calls a region as Tarshish. Now where does Tarshish is a matter of debate. Right? Some Western scholars say it's somewhere near Greece, somewhere near Spain. Now the location which Tabari mentions appears to be somewhere near Lebanon per se. But he goes and meets three tribes there. You know, Humyun, Sindhan and one other tribe basically. And understands what was the history of Middle East before Christianity. And around this time, around 900 BC, there is across the board traditions of a mighty world conqueror from Bharat, which he in Arabic calls as Zarj. Okay? Unfortunately, we only have one part of a name called Zarj. Phonetically, Zarj translates to Zera in Semitic, and the original is Jaya. Okay? Now, we don't know, is it Vijaya? Is it Jaya Simha? Unfortunately, we have only one part of a name. Okay? What did this Chakravarti Jaya do? So at that point of time in Israel, in Jerusalem, there was a king who came and said, I don't like idol worship. Anybody who worships idol, the guy should either convert to the God of Abraham or he should be killed or banished. All temples were destroyed, there was huge desecration. So certain tribes called Benjamin and Judah said that, boss, somebody needs to defend us. All our temples are under attack. So they traveled all the way to Bharat. They met Chakravarti Jaya or Zarj and told him, please defend us. Chakravarti Jaya launches, and Tabari mentions this in great detail, all the military formations, you know, uh, the expedition, etc. Launches a hundred ship navy from the western coast of Bharat, right up first in the head of Persian Gulf, then marches over land to the Tarshish coast or somewhere in the Mediterranean coast in Lebanon, and then very skillfully blockades and surrounds Jerusalem, forcing it to surrender. Okay? So just try and understand this. Nearly 3,000 years ago, a Chakravarti from Bharat launched a military expedition 7,000 kilometers away to defend an ancient idol worshipping, uh, they call it a polytheistic, but ultimately a Sanatan allied religion and civilization from being extinct. Right? That was the reason why such a large expedition was launched. Now, talking about uh, basically 1400 years back. Now the first caliphate of Islam was called a Rashidun Caliphate. In, in year 12, okay, the Caliph Abu Bakr in a letter to his general Khalid bin Walid writes that, you know at this point of time, year 12 of the Islamic calendar which is about 633 uh, CE, Al-Ubula in Iraq is under attack by the Indians from the sea. Okay? Translated by Khaled Yaya, translation of R.C. Majumdar is the Indian Navy from the sea. The Indian Navy from the sea. So effectively in year 12, al Ubula in Iraq was under Indian naval attack. Now is that the only reference we have? Not really. In year 16, we have another reference where the next Caliph, Caliph Umar says that right now I am threatened. The Persians have been destroyed in the Battle of al Qasiriya. So the Sassanian Empire, which is the Zoroastrian Empire, was nearly wiped out, was facing an existential crisis because of the march of the caliphate. At that point of time, the Caliph Umar says that I am now being threatened by the Shahanu Shai al-Hind, the king of Hal-Hind, who is leading a force of the, of the insurrectionists. So at that time, Oman was in rebellion. So who is leading, who's leading these, supporting these people and is threatening and attacking the Alfa Peninsula. Please retreat back 80 kilometers and set up a new garrison. That garrison, they called it as Basra. One of the principal cities and principal Middle Eastern commercial centers today historically. So one of the greatest cities of the Middle East, in fact of the entire Islamic world, was established because of the fear or a threat of the Bharatiya Navy. So just have a pause and think about that. Obviously, how do we identify the king? Because the same guy who records the Caliph's letters 
also talks about the name of the Shahru Shai al Hind about a few years ago and calls him Furumisha, translated as Pramesha or Pulakesha. Now, Pulakeshin had, had a lot of Birudasa titles Satya Shriya Pulakeshin Parameshwara. So, that name is basically Chalukya. Uh, so, today in our history textbooks, we we often study about Chalukya Pulakeshin as fighting against Harshavardhana or fighting against Pallavas. You know, and obviously Narsimha Varma Pallava uh, has a vengeance and attacks. The problem is we never study about the greatest achievements of the Chal of Chalukya Pulakeshin, which is actually fighting against the Rashidun Caliphate. The problem, I, I would say, is more fundamental. Why we don't study it and why do we study these aspects, which I'll come to later. Then the Pratihara reads, there is a Sanskrit inscription called Gopadri Prashasti. Okay? This Gopadri Prashasti was written around uh, 815 CE, you know, about 1200 years back. Now this Gopadri Prashasti says that this Pratihara king called Nagabhat was greatly devout to Prabhu Sri Ram. And he said, just like Sri Ram crossed the ocean and, and uh, conquered the Lanka and defeated Adharma, similarly we are Vanaras. We will cross the Aparanta Samudra and do a Lanka Adhana of who is the Adharma out there. Okay? So at that same point of time, 815-820 CE, we find two Arabic references, Tufail al-Ayan from Oman, okay? and a Sira or Arabic letter written by an Islamic missionary in Basra in Iraq called Munir ibn Rayyan, who say that we are under attack, we are being raided by the Kufra from Al-Hind. Okay? So at the same time when somebody in Bharat is saying that we have crossed Aparanta Samudra, we are actually going to strike them as the Vanaras, you know, as Hanuman uh, you know, set fire to Lanka, we are also going to strike. So they, they actually cut the supply lines. At that point of time, the Arabs were in Sindh, they were trying to advance further. So Na Pratyahara Nagabhat said that Sama Dana Bheda Vihina uh, Ananya Pratapa Dinamukha or Sama or Diplomacy Dana Gifts and Bheda or showing discord all we are now Vihina of that we no longer have any relevance for that right now the only option to be shown to the invaders Ananya Pratapa to show our military Veda and for this he attacked them in their own home to cut their supply lines consequently Nagabhat was able to liberate the whole of eastern Sindh and substantially, even the uh, kingdoms of Western Sindh finally fell down. The Caliphate's authority actually ceased after a few decades. Parmara Lakshmadev. There is an inscription, Sanskrit inscription called uh, Nagpur Prashasti, which is stored in the Central Museum in Nagpur. This inscription tells us that around 900 years back, a Parmara ruler called Lakshmadev, who is compared often to Lakshmadev and his brother Naravarman, are compared to Ram and Bharat. So Naravarman told Lakshmadev, please go ahead and fight the Turishkas because they have come. They are, this Turishka, this Ghaznavi, he has desecrated Somnath, he has desecrated so many temples. Please go ahead, do not bother about the kingdom. I will take your slippers on your throne and manage your kingdom and manage your rivals here. Please go ahead without fear and fight them. This Parmara Lakshmadev crossed the Khyber, went to the Vangshu. The Sanskrit shloka very clearly says, on Vangshu, he did Vyuharachna. He did his military formations and wiped out the Turishkas. And the Turishkas presented him a lot of Ashwa, a lot of horses as tribute. And the Kira king, the Karakhani king of Uzbekistan, started singing songs like a caged parrot. Okay? This is what the Sanskrit Shluka says. Okay? So effectively, he was about the river Oxus, Vangshu's river Oxus. He was threatening his formation as such that he was threatening the key religious place of the Turkish Sultanates. All the Turkish Sultanates. Seljuk, Yamini, or Karakhanid had a very strong religious attachment to a place called Termes, which was all their main theologians were there. Parmara Lakshmane positioned his forces exactly near that city. He did not desecrate it, he did not storm it, but it was a psychological warfare telling them that if you could desecrate our temples, we could very well reach very close to yours. Okay? Now, that is Parmara Lakshmane. I think Rajendra Chola is very famous. I think uh, I'm actually in, uh, in the right place and the right time for this. But very effectively, there are certain aspects. How many people here know why Rajendra Chola launched an expedition in Southeast Asia? Why? Can somebody just... Yeah. Very good. More effectively? Yeah. Okay. 
very good great great ha uh, ha fantastic very good i think both of you are uh, both of you are right and i think i should be a little garden ask my questions maybe <laughs> but a, a little more i'll expand on that so the king of ha huh, correct so uh, all of you are right basically so there was a dynasty called the shailendra dynasty which ruled over sumatra and malaysia now what happened is they wanted to monopolize trade between the east and the west okay for establishing this monopoly they did a lot of things so like ji fong do they, they kind of put to debt anybody who didn't stop or didn't transship in their ports okay they went to the chinese empire the song empire and told them don't give access to the ainu river to the uh, you know merchants from bharat etc you know these uh, give access only to us okay then they nationalized key products like teak teak was a very key product which is also exported from bharat right they nationalized they said only people from our malaya sumatra will be able to produce this okay so it was a very clear attack number one on economic interest but very importantly also as per the arabic writer ibn sulaiman the king of this shailendra empire in sumatra malaya started boasting that he is a chakravarti par excellence or he is a chakravarti who is far superior as per ibn sulaiman to any of the lands of hind obviously gangai kondan rajendra cholan who had expanded up till ganga the same rajendra chola who had allies like parmaras and ghadawalas of the north who was effectively the emperor of bharat could not take this lying down right so there was an attack on the political prestige there was an attack on the economic interests there was a move to cut off indian merchants from the uh, from a key market and that's why this expedition was taken this expedition covered 14 places not just sumatra malaysia but vietnam champa it covered burma it covered thailand and it was so effective it was a classic example of sea control and complete dominance for 3 years after rajendra chola's expedition there was so much of a sheer shock and awe that not a single ship not a single merchant from any single southeast asian country and the as per song empire and a chinese text even ventured out into the sea not a single embassy left sumatra malaya etc to china and the song emperor who was the emperor of china actually had to beg them please come here please come to my court please kind of cross the seas but for 3 years there was a complete still the only ships which roamed that entire south china sea the east china sea etc were the chola ships of bharat i mean that is the impact it was not a raid a lot of people say this was a raid they went and built temples this was clear sheer geopolitical control gadawal govinda chandra the invisible king but who is one of the most greatest master statesmen and diplomats of our history now godwal govinda chandra was from kanyagupja kannauj okay he lived around 1114 1115 ce etc okay now this king was a great friend of kulatunga chola okay he was a great ally of cholas he in fact fought campaigns within bharat in support of the cholas his sister married a chola prince and her inscription is found in tanjavur very near the brihadeshwara or the big temple of rajaraja her inscription is found there the same gadwala govinda chandra formed the alliance with the king of kashmir so imagine on one side with lohara dynasty of kashmir on the other hand with the parmaras with the cholas and he attacked lahore which was then the center of ghazni the ghaznavid power and occupied it for some time so just imagine this person okay forget his chinese expedition which will come to now just imagine this person put a diplomatic web from kashmir sharad right down to tanjavur and took a stand against the ghaznavid rulers this gadawala govinda chandra as per a text called prakrit pangalam did something very interesting i'm sorry i'll just uh, close now next two slides he made as per this prakrit text the king of china okay the raja of china darpahin darpahin without all his arrogance was smashed okay and he made him run away from the run so he, from he went and there was actually hakan the pulse so there was a complete hue and cry 
and this chinese emperor was a song emperor had to run away from the battlefield so why did gadawala go to china he was an ally of kulatunga chola if you know of chola is at that point of time kulatunga chola established lot of military bases all across the southeast asian and the china sea the song empire at that time a large part of it was supporting those people who were opposing the cholas in doing it gadawala govind chandra as a trusted ally fought this battle with the chinese to see that they don't intervene in this larger strategy so a very invisible forgotten hero of indian history and uh, just to conclude you know sometime uh, whenever i go to any such conference or when i go to any such uh, kind of event you know many people make lot of statements one statement which is made is you know modern indian history writing is very delhi centric i say rubbish if it was delhi centric then we all of us would know of anakpal tomar anakpal tomar reestablish indraprast okay a lot of people say modern indian history has a bias towards north india rubbish if that was the case and gadawal govind chandra parmara lakshma dev would be very prominent in all our textbooks but i will tell you what modern indian history writing is modern indian history writing is heavily biased and in fact i'm sorry if i may use this word is anti hindu centric okay it is delhi centric when it comes to sultanates okay it is east centric when it comes to the british it's bombay centric when it comes to the british but it is anti hindu centric or astika anti astika hindu centric which is the great national empire before the british how many will people will tell you marathas how many people how many people will how many people will tell you about guptas rashtrakutas cholas cholas are a bharatiya empire that's why i want to correct i want to correct that what will you see we'll say ashoka was the last great king chandragupta maurya unified bharat etc but also remember what comes after that ashoka was a great king who converted to buddhism after kalinga and that's how the peaceful era of bharat was started so yes mauryans were great unifiers guptas were also great unifiers rashtrakutas were great unifiers cholas were great unifiers when when you start cholas what will you start with cholas were a dynasty of south india or cholas were a dynasty of tamil or cholas were a dravidian dynasty okay whatever it is okay now nara people are saying cholas are not even a sanatan dynasty okay now there are people who are saying shivapada shekaran singh there was a movie which was shown in that in that movie a person who got the title called shivapada shekaran was shown most more in a buddhist monastery i like buddhism but was shown more in a buddhist monastery than doing abhishekam to his favorite god who is lord shiva so anyway so that is what our history is so let us accept let's not get regionalized okay and it is this same amnesia of regionalizing our astika hindu rulers of breaking their vision of telling them they are castes they are regionalists because that is a narrative they want to provide to us today that you are all hindus if you accept you go to a temple if you are astikas you don't have a vision you are small minded that is precisely the reason why nobody has talked about our shastra dharma abroad nobody has talked about how our bharat military operations actually conquered and instilled the fear of god in several of these invaders we need to study our weak points we also need to be inspired because right now in the existential crisis we are fighting we also need to have imbibe shastra dharma within us not to be scared and be inspired by these different heroes thank you namaskaram and vande mataram I request Sri Hari Menon ji and Sri Hari Chandran ji to come up to the stage for the book launch. Ravi Chandran ji, I'm I also request Dr. Morelli to present the memento to Venkatesh ji. Let's take a quick continental coffee break for the next 15 minutes which will be followed by many other exciting book launches. <laughs>